going to be in John 1, verse 14. Once everybody's there, then we'll say prayer. Dan, you want to say prayer again? Before we start? Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would stand upon us and be with us through this, help us to learn who is in taking this. Help us to bless this. Give us a song. The Lord, we praise you. Help us to be whole and worthy. Amen. 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 It says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So week two, the Bethlehem candle. It says, if you're using an Advent wreath, light the purple candle of hope, last week's focus, and the purple candle of love. If you're using an Advent wreath, light the purple candle of hope, which was last week's, which we did in the beginning. And then we're lighting the Bethlehem candle now. And it says, notice how two candles bring greater light than one. You have heard it said, well sung, that you need, that all you need is love. And it's true, all we need is love. If that if that love is from above, and if that love is self-sacrificing, it redeems all. And if that love is patient, kind, protects, trusts, hopes, and pre and if that love is patient, kind, protects, trusts, hopes, and preserves. I'm not talking about an emotion, a feeling, or even a choice. I'm talking about a person. One who walked this earth fully man and fully God. One who came to a manger, went to a cross, rose from the dead, and ascended, ascended into heaven with a promise to return one day. Love is found in Jesus. He came not to be served, but to serve. He is the ultimate example of love. How to live, lo how to live love, give love, and be loved one to another. His love led to complete sacrifice for you and for me. While he walked the earth, a group of highly religious men wanted to stomp, to stump him with with a question they ask what is the greatest commandment to which jesus replied in matthew chapter 22 verse 37 to 39 they ask what is the greatest commandment to which jesus replied jesus said unto him thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy mind this is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments shall hang all the law and the prophets. Love God and love others, simple but not easy. This week, as you think about love, remember he loved us first and that all, all that that is all the power we need to love one another. Who can you serve with love this week? Acts of love can be anything, a kind word, a heartfelt, a heartfelt smile, a warm hug, doing the dishes, or simply leaning in and listening to someone else's story. So now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to read 19, verses 19 to 21. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately privately but while he thought on these things behold an angel of the lord appeared unto him in a dream saying joseph thou son of david fear not to take unto thee mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the holy ghost and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save his people from their sins We're given just a little glimpse of Mary and Joseph before Jesus was born. They lived in a hill country in the hill country of Galilee. Joseph was a religious man. Mary gives every evidence of having a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. 
Even though she was a teenager, the Bible teaches that God was so pleased with her that he chose her to be the mother of Jesus. Mary and Joseph weren't married, and yet Mary became pregnant. I've often put myself in jo Joseph's place, imagined his thoughts, his aspirations about the girl to whom he was engaged, but Joseph decided to break the engage engagement privately. While he was thinking about these things, God's angel appeared into him in a dream to give Joseph an explanation of the situation. All Joseph's suspicions were put away. He accepted that God had what God had said through the angel, and he was immediately married to Mary. Both Joseph and Mary followed the call and plan of God, and through their obedience, the way, the way was prepared for Christ to come and bless us. Are you seeking to follow God's call in your life? Are you actively responding to him? Without Mary and Joseph following the calling that God was giving them and, the, and their role in Jesus coming onto this earth, we wouldn't have, Jesus wouldn't have come in the way that he did. There, there have been so many things that had changed and different timing and everything else that it wouldn't have been the same. But I mean, God's timing is the best timing. And, it, and God knows also, he knew that they were going to accept and do it anyways, that they were going to follow his plan because they were both yeah, they ran to God. They were very devout and followed him and followed his commandments and knew, knew the scripture and knew that God was God, that he was real, that he wasn't just, you know, some made-up fictional character that a lot of people think. And during this Christmas season, I feel like that for the Bethlehem candle, it not only shows us that there was a lot of love given and without that love how would so we were discussing dad's question about if he basically said it would have worked any other way if it wouldn't have been mary and joseph when we were reading there or joseph had thought to secretly put her away privately so that she wouldn't be made a public example or anything like that and then when the angel came and talked to him and he obviously decide otherwise and decide to follow God's plan there. But when you go back into the earlier part of the, uh, the first chapter of Matthew, and it goes through the lineage, and when you look at, it starts at, well, it starts at 15. And it says, and Ilad begat Elazar, and Elazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And I'm sure there was generations and generations and generations and generations of, of and you could say thousands and thousands of different people throughout the lineage of David, from, from David down, with so-and-so had like 14 sons, and each of those sons had 10 or whatever, and well you get what i'm saying with his lineage you go down and then each time you just keep multiplying multiplying and i'm sure there was when you got down to around where jacob and mathen and joseph are that there was there was so many of the line of david um, obviously unless they died out or the war they went through and stuff like that but the ones that were left there was probably ample choices but out of them, God, from how it's worded in the scriptures, it sounds like God found and decided to use the one man in the lineage from, from David that was very God-fearing, followed God, wanted to um, please God and knew that God was real and knew that he had a purpose, that there was a purpose and knew and understood the prophecies of old that were about to be unraveling. And I think that it may not, it may not have worked any other way. And God knew that because he knew his heart. He knew Mary's heart. And if it would have been somebody else in that lineage, one of Joseph's brothers or one of even even if it backed up a generation and, and with with his dad Jacob, one of Joseph's uncles or anything like that, that there 
may not have been somebody that was as fully faith-filled and God-driven as Joseph was, or would have been like Joseph, even when he sought to put her away, he, he wanted to do it privately, and maybe the, his other brothers or uncles or whatever in that lineage would have publicly stoned her. Chapter 1, and it says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So we go into chapter 2. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the, pe of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They sent unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, then, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently that the, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, and I may come and worship him also. And obviously, I don't think that's what he was feigning. Mm -hmm. as, as grumpy as he was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and Rama was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth into a dream to Joseph, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. He arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when they had heard our Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in the dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So I was reading in some of my, well, in John, and then when I was doing my New Testament studies, too, that when Orthodox Jews are asked why they do not believe in Jesus, it's because they said that it's because of Galilee. And... Obviously, when he went into Nazareth and he was called a Nazarene, that was part of the prophecy. But they believed that he would still be, and that he would be originally from Bethlehem, lived in Bethlehem, and all of that. And 
But in, in the scriptures and the prophecies, when looking back, a lot of this, the different Jews that were upset at Jesus and the things that he was teaching and stuff like that, and him saying that uh, uh, the Father is in me and, uh, and the Father and that kind of thing, that they were, they were obviously upset because that was the biggest um, blasphemy was to say that you're God because there's only one God. There's no other God but God. But um, it, it never says in any of the Gospels where where there's priests and they say that well he's a Nazarene he's he's from Ga he's a Galilean he's from Galilee he can't be the Son of God he can't be the Messiah but it's never ever none of them ever thought to even say hey where were you born that would have been one of the missing pieces to be for them to be able to get over the part where he supposedly to them blasphemed when he said that he and the father are one but that was one of the things that a lot of the jewish people they just they just can't get over because he is a galilean he he couldn't be the son of god he couldn't be the messiah because the messiah was supposed to come from bethlehem and jesus did come from bethlehem he just didn't stay there and that his his parents was in Galilee before that. That they had went and left. But I think that the Bethlehem candle, I know that it talks about how it um it represents love and that it represents Bethlehem and that kind of thing. But without the love that God not only had for us in bringing Jesus onto the earth through the Virgin Mary and and Joseph allowing it that we that even though Mary allowed it if Joseph wouldn't have believed believed in God and believed in the prophecy and knew what it said and was a God fearing man that he was he would have been that step there that would have kept everything from happening and the Bethlehem candle should remind us that whatever God has planned for us, that we need to accept it and to follow what he has planned because he knows where we're going with it. And he knows, well, he knows where he's going to take us with it, not where, where we, we ourselves are going to go with it, but he knows where he's going to take us with it. And that one day it could be something that it won't ever be as big as the, bringing the Son of God onto this earth, but it could be something that, that glorifies God and brings people to Jesus and accepting Him and knowing Him so that one day when we all get to heaven or that one day, one day soon, hopefully, that a lot of people, that, that the, instead of the gates of hell widening every day, that we, that we start to widen the population of heaven a little bit more when people die versus when people die that hell keeps widening and widening and widening. But I think that a lot of people forget when it comes to the story of Jesus. Is Jesus is the most important part of the story, and but they tend to forget, like you'd said earlier, that Joseph. I mean, we hear Joseph. We hear that he. Uh, that he was going to privately put her away, but the angel, you know, told him not to, and he willingly accepted, and because obviously he he could have just said, put her away and go on with his life, and he didn't, because without him being there and marrying her, that would have been something else there that wouldn't have helped to protect and keep Jesus going on this earth. Obviously, God was doing that, but when you think about it, when you go from where Joseph was going to put her away privately and he doesn't do it, then you go into where he was born and Herod hears about him. And some of the scribes and priests and stuff. And then you got them that was against him, especially Herod, because Herod didn't want any other king but him. And then the, king, the, the Messiah was going to be the king of the Jews. And they all thought when the Messiah came that he was going to be this big king. That got into this world and he he was going to oh well when Jesus got older that he was going to be this big king this strong warrior and that he was going to 
ride through in his war horse and save them from uh, the Romans that were taking them over at that time. And they didn't realize that their king was just like them, grew up like they did. He was not considered, he was not in a family that was a big reigning royal family, that he was in a family that was kind of like a your blue collar working family where he grew up and he was a carpenter up until his ministry started. And I'm sure that they didn't have a lot of money or anything else. I mean, carpenters would have made money back then like they do now, but you wasn't on king level where you was just getting your rat, your riches and your gold coming in and everything else. And that God, that Jesus came down or came into this earth to us like us. And I think that that, that talks, that, sh that should talk to, to some people because even though he was the king of the Jews, he was the Messiah that came down on this earth, he still was one of us as, on, on, as his human form, that he felt the same emotions because a lot of people just thought he just kind of went through life, this soft, gentle spoken, whatever, other than when he flipped the tables you know, gentle sp spoken person, but he could, he literally could have been on this earth laughing and joking with people, um, smiling, sad. I mean, obviously you'd see where he was sad when Lazarus died and stuff like that, but feeling the sadness. And I'm sure that even though he knew that, you know, with God, all things were possible with him on earth too. I'm sure that he c still was able to feel all of the things that we feel here on this earth. He was just the son of God. So he was, he had a lot easier time, or at least I would think he would have a lot easier time as the son of God being up with God and coming down, resisting sin versus us that was born into this world through sin and he was born into this world sinless. I agree with you in a sense and in a sense I don't because I think we all it makes us feel better to think that Jesus went through all the things that we did, the temptations, the, the feelings, the hurt, the sadness, the happiness, all that stuff. But he was the son of God. He had God with him. 